fourth challenge. I already mentioned three challenges, global governance. I spoke about our neighborhood. I was explaining that we had to tackle our relationship with the strategic partners. The fourth big uh, issue uh, and challenge is about the conflicts in the world and also the humanita humanitarian disasters in the world. How are we capable on this planet where perhaps differently than uh, our grandparents, uh, we are aware in a microsecond of the tremendous loss of life that can occur when things happen, tragedies, earthquakes, or worse, perhaps in a moral fashion, when people uh, create uh, tremendous uh, uh, pain to each other by engaging in war and in conflict. And without making a world tour, would be too depressing. But uh, I cannot but think of a few areas of intense or sometimes simmering conflict. And it might be very nearby, such as in the Caucasus or in the Balkan, or further away in the Horn of Africa or in Afghanistan. It is clear that for these conflict situations uh, and for these humanitarian disasters, EU is committed to be part of the solution. And it is a big challenge to be able to do so in an efficient and in an effective way. It is true that the member states have invested alone or under the guidance of the UN and the EU human and financial capital, very often also with military means. Uh, think, for example, of the Operation Atlanta against piracy off the coast of uh, Somalia. And all these efforts have been done in order to defend human rights standards, to show solidarity, to protect also uh, interests and stabilize borders. But it is clear that conflicts not only cause a security challenge, but they also give rise to humanitarian disasters and make people move around in neighboring countries. Uh, very often conflicts cause complex clusters of problems, but I think that one sees that the EU is increasingly well armed uh, with a diversified range of instruments of civilian, humanitarian or military nature to tackle them. And I shall come back to that later in this lecture. But it is clear that the world awaits us when it comes to these world conflicts uh, and that we need to take our responsibility in order to be, uh, be uh, of a favorable uh, impact to, to these situations. Lastly and fifthly, I would like to men mention uh, the, the, the last big challenge and I know that uh, amongst youngsters there is a big sense of sensibility to these problems and it's about managing climate change, keeping, keeping access to natural resources and safeguard food security. These are three very closely related, it's a cluster of, uh, of challenges uh, that are very related and that have a rather horizontal nature where the EU is playing I think a major role. Building for instance on an ambitious climate package adopted in 2008 and transformed into law soon after, the EU has been a very active player in the international negotiations of the UNFCCC, the UN Framework Convention Against Climate Change, and in the discussions on the follow-up regime of the Kyoto Protocol. We had some difficulty in the beginning. We had a very bitter experience with the Copenhagen Summit, where we found ourselves with a very, let's say, well-established point of view of the European Union, but unfortunately with a a lack of negotiation tools uh, and it put us in the position of being in the corridor when Obama with uh, some of the other leading forces of the planet was discussing the deal uh, Europe found itself uh, outside uh, over there where you are you, you can en enter you don't have to be shy <laughs> but uh, uh, we as a European Union we had uh, difficulty in uh, pushing forward our agenda in Copenhagen it went much better afterwards in Cancun and we think that in Kyoto we had a very nice result also uh, under the Belgian presidency but it's clear that the next uh, steps in, in South Africa will continue to uh, to be of a very important nature to simply give you some figures about this fifth challenge did you know that well, today on this planet we're approximately 6.9 billion people almost 7 billion people in about uh, 20 years time is it 20 years no it's uh, it's by 2025 no it will be in 14 years 
In 14 years' time, we probably will not be 6.9 billion, we will be 8 billion. A rise with more than a billion people. Now, when talking about food security, did you know that the development of the world, and of course the choices that are made, the dietary demands that are very natural because people want to have a decent life, they do not only want to have a life, they want to have a decent life, demand in food is going to rise not with, let's say, one-seventh, going from 6.9 to 8, it's going to rise by 50%, 50%. That's incredible. Talking about fresh water, did you know that by uh, 2025 we expect uh, no less than 36 countries, no less than 36 countries with a total population of about 1.4 billion people to, to experience shortages in fresh water? Shortages in fresh water. It is something that, which is very much associated with the basis of life. And all these people are going to struggle to get fresh water. Only two examples to give you an idea that this fifth challenge is really a tremendous one. In all of these challenges, you will of course remark that the development of an international action by the EU was very often driven by internal policies or motives. And in order to offer safety to our citizens, to provide them with export markets and trade opportunities to mitigate the effects of climate change or migrations that are caused outside our borders, or to assist neighboring countries in transition to stabilize their societies and create human security for the local populations at local levels. These are internal motives that drive the EU in its action uh, abroad. It were motives that were largely absent in the first years of the European communities, but over the years, the development of internal policies has taken such a proportion that these policies lose their purpose if they're not accompanied by corresponding external actions. However, I want to insist, and especially before a young audience, that internal policy motivations are not alone in explaining the external action of the EU. Even before the EU developed into a major actor in internal policy areas in the past two decades, other more voluntaristic, more noble motives for the development of an external action of the EU had always been a prominent driver of external action, such as, for example, the defense of our core values in the world. In a globalizing world with instant information on crisis situations abroad, the public awareness of what is right and wrong has increased dramatically. And in that respect, I want to say with a lot of conviction, when I hear comments on the fact that the Belgian government, very much supported by the Belgian parliament, because there was unanimity, unanimity less one, to engage in a military action in Libya, the cynical explanation is always available. Oh, it's about interests, it's about oil, it's about uh, economic interests. The cynical view is always available. But I tell you, as a responsible politician for Belgium, there was no cynicism in our choice. It was really, really about coming to the rescue of the Benghazi people. It was really about defending our core values when it's about democracy. And it was not about cynical reasons to act. And I think it's very dangerous to explain before a an audience that, of course, has to be informed by all those who speak and uh, take the floor, it's very dangerous to give an idea that, ex that external policy is always based on internal interests. I think that's a very pujadist and a very populist way of explaining the motives of our diplomats, of our soldiers, and of our politicians. And let me simply state on a very personal level that in my mind, when we took this very important, tremendous responsibility of sending people to Libya, taking into account that it was at the risk of their lives, that was a decision that was taken in a unanimous Belgian parliament without a reflection about will this serve our interests or will it be about the values of human life. It was of course the latter and there was no uh, discussion about it. Now, let me 
try to go towards the what to do logic. It is clear that the EU seems to offer the right scale of operation in our complex and globalized world. The years of small is beautiful have been uh, forgotten. Now the trend is to say that size does matter. Nation states remain at the heart of international politics and diplomacy, and as the Belgian foreign minister, I'm the last in this hall to deny it. But most policymakers have now understood that the national level has it li its limits. Many years ago, Paul Henri Spark used to say that all European nations are small, but not all of them had understood it already. That period seems now to be firmly behind us, but in times of crisis, we have sometimes to be reminded of this truism. For instance, last July, Wolfgang Schauble, the finance minister of the biggest member state of the EU, or the Germany, uh, referred to this issue when defending before the Constitutional Court in Karlsruhe the German government's decision in the case of the European support actions for Greece. And he said, every single European country, also the German Federal Republic, were all too small to assume our interests and responsibilities in a globalized world. My own experience as a foreign minister has convinced me more, ever, more than ever that no country, as big or as important as it might be, is capable of tackling global challenges alone. But another element is true as well. No country, how modest sized it might be, should think that it cannot be part of the solution. It's also important to mention that second part of the bigness argument. Probably we're all too small to solve the problems all by ourselves, but no one of us can use the excuse of being not too big to think that it cannot be part of the solution. I think that uh, all in all, when looking at the European Union, tremendous progress was made in the development of policy instruments for the conduct of our external relations. And, of course, the Treaty of Lisbon enlarged our toolbox considerably. The entry into force of the treaty concluded a period of about nine years of intense negotiations and public discussions, producing eventually a new treaty, amending the two, two basic treaties of the EU, uh, the Treaty of Rome and the Treaty of Maastricht. The principal task that was given to the drafters of the new treaty was to adapt the European decision-making procedure to the new realities of an enlarged EU. But of course, another objective was already looming behind these discussions in the first decade of the 21st century. How could the member states of the EU improve its influence in world affairs? How could we better be heard? How could our views be brought forward with more forceful conviction and unified negotiating position? positions. These were, the, the, these were precisely the questions the new treaty sought to answer as well. And rapidly recalling five major innovations of the Treaty of Lisbon regarding the conduct of external relations of the EU, you will have a view on what the Lisbon Treaty brought to us. First, of course, the creation of the function of the High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, having Catherine <coughs> Ashton as double-headed uh, being on the same side, part of Commission, and being a representative of uh, the 27 uh, member states in uh, issues where uh, the, the Council of uh, Foreign Affairs is presided by her, gives us a new uh, impetus. Secondly, the creation of the European External Action Service, let's say the European Diplomacy, is also a new tool that uh, needs to be worked upon. It, uh, it exists uh, uh, since very shortly, so uh, we still have a lot of work to be done, but it is clear that this external action service, this European diplomacy, is a tool that will be uh, very useful in uh, creating more unity 